Welcome to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. I'm your host, Hisham Mazuz, and this week I was joined by Ben Hobday. Ben has been on a fantastic recruitment journey. For the last 12 years, he's worked for Austin Fraser, and before that, he worked for Hayes. What we uncovered in this episode really was we dug deep into leadership. Ben uh, has been on a, a really interesting journey going from just being an individual contributor to becoming one of the best leaders within the brand that he works for. So if you're anyone that's aspiring to be a leader, you're currently on that leadership journey, you're gonna absolutely love this episode full of practical advice and tips on how you can become a better leader. So enjoy this episode. Ben Hobday, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Excited for this, obviously uh, intended to have you at the live podcast, yeah. but nature nature got yeah. in the way, yeah. but in a positive way. Absolutely. So obviously a little one came, all okay? Yeah, a little bit early, but um, yeah, it was all good. And here we are today. So uh, where we always like to start is, particularly with someone in, in the position that you're in now and the journey that you've been on, probably just something that you've, you've thought a lot about. So I'd love to hear your take on like, what does Ben believe are the characteristics and traits of like a really high performing recruiter in, in today's market? Yeah, um, I think for me, I look at skills and behaviours, right? So yeah. for me, things like integrity, mm. all those things are, are really important. I think a lot of recruitment businesses look for passion, determination, resilience. I think they're yeah, a yeah. kind of prerequisite. Yeah, yeah. Like for me, I look for emotional intelligence. Are you coachable? Um, mm. Can you spark conversation? Can you tell a story? Mm. Um, we're here to solve problems, right? So mm. are you a good problem solver? Um, emotional intelligence is like massive. Yeah. Uh, can you read a room? Um, those kind of things. And I think um, it's, it's easy just to look at someone who's hardworking. Yeah, yeah. But if you can't learn from a situation, mm. it's gonna be very difficult. Yeah, so yeah. typically they're the things, like coachability for me is massive. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you learn? So when, when can you, on the coachability thing, I love that. When can you, what are the things to look out for when you, like maybe early signs of like, mm, this yeah. person isn't maybe willing to l um, listen or at least take yeah. on other people. Like what, is, what have been the common like key indicators early yeah. on do you think that you've seen in your time? <clears throat> Definitely, can you take feedback? Um, <laughs> yeah. Like that's like a massive one. If you can't take really? feedback, I mean, you're going to get nowhere, right? So yeah, yeah. I think constructive feedback, um, learning from it, asking questions on the feedback. If mm. someone just goes, yeah, 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 and then does the same mistake, like they obviously don't it. understand, right? So you've got to be able to seek to understand, take mm. that feedback. And it's, it, recruitment's continuous improvement. Like yeah, that's, yeah. that's all we're trying to do, find a better way. So yeah, do they listen? Do they ask questions off the back of feedback? Yeah, yeah. Um, and how they react to it, yeah. Do you think you can make someone more coachable? Definitely, because I, I think I'm an example of... Um, really? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I was quite hell-bent on working really, really hard and just working harder than everyone else when I first joined. Yeah. Um, it wasn't that I wasn't coachable. It's that I probably didn't listen enough. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a prime example of, you know, <laughs> someone who probably didn't, didn't, yeah. didn't take to it quite so quickly. I love that. So who, so obviously you, you spent a lot of your career at Austin Fraser. Yeah. And then before that you was at Hayes. Yeah. Right. Who, who, was, uh, who was Ben before recruitment? Yeah, so um, I was a personal trainer, basically. Was it? Yeah, yeah, it's classic personal trainer. Or <laughs> it's normally a, a state agent or a personal yeah, trainer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah personal trainer, um, you know, very average at school, to be okay. completely honest. Um, didn't really apply myself outside of sports. Mm. Got a job in a gym because my friends did. Yeah. And then really kind of realised I needed to get a real job because hanging out in the gym all day is pretty easy, um, mm. but it's not gonna pay the bills. It's hard though, no? Like you got this, I feel like I've had friends that have been, like it's a sales job. Yeah, I but think I- sometimes people miss. Agreed, I think that's why it was a nice tra transition yeah, yeah. into recruitment, but if you're selling your services, you know, you're doing that all the time. But I think for me, it was just at the point where everyone want, wanted to start being a personal trainer. Right, okay. So I kind of just bailed, bailed out of it. Really? Yeah. So who, who sold, like, how did, you, how did you stumble into recruitment? Did you have the classic story of, like, one of my clients used to be a recruiter and they yeah, told me about it? Because yeah. we've had that a few times. Yeah, it's just basically a friend. A friend was oh, like, really? I'm doing recruitment. I used yeah. to work in a gym. It's talking to people all the time. Yeah, yeah. Give it a go. I went to one interview, got the job, and yeah. straight away I was like, yeah, this is, a, this is for me. So did you start in construction? Yeah. What was that like? People ask me all the time in interviews, like, it's, it's a different world. Like, different what was like the typical job title? Oh, I, I was doing labourers, wow. um, bricklayers, carpenters. So, you know, like real, real challenging jobs. And, you know, on a Monday, if it was raining, people just wouldn't go to work. So I'd spend the first <laughs> hour on Monday. Yeah, yeah, day rate, contract stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. And then, so you did that for a couple of years, yeah. right? 
So I guess j just on this, on the early part of your career, I guess what what I always like to ask this point, just curious, like what what do you think a criminal recruitment has given you that maybe you least expected? Um, good question. I, I think for me, the opportunity to do something that I really enjoy, mm. that um, has given me all of the opportunities in my life outside of work. Like yeah, I yeah. think it's very rare. I look at some of my friends they haven't had the opportunities to, to, to move forward in their career or yeah, yeah. potentially in uh, the outside of work. And I think for me, I've had the opportunity through recruitment to do all of that and do a job that I actually really love, right? Yeah, yeah, um, which that. is rare. Yeah, so rare. Yeah. What, um, what, what, what was Ben motivated by in those early days? What was like your key? Competition, probably. Really? Like, m money and competition. Um, mm. you know, I'm a competitive bloke, right? Um, yeah. And I wanted to make money. And I... Um, I think those two, were the, when I first started, those, that competition of, when I left construction, I was quite good. Yeah. And then I came to Austin Fraser and I was terrible. Really? You know, the standard was just up here. Yeah. And I joined and I was like rock bottom. I was really? the worst in the office, comfortably. Mm. And I think that competition of proving that you can do it, yeah, it yeah, yeah. Like, got me through. Really got you through. Yeah. So when you, so when you went to Austin Fraser, how long, how long have you been at AF now? 12 years. Nice. So I guess, like obviously went from construction and I'm assuming, I think when I saw on your LinkedIn, was it like infrastructure yeah. you started on something like that? Yeah, infrastructure. Obviously I'm assuming that there was a different skill set needed. Mm. Was it entirely different? Yeah, huge. I mean, people say, oh, it was okay, you were in recruitment before. I had to literally forget everything. Everything, because really? I was used to walking onto a building site and making friends with the site manager, yeah. you know, buying them donuts, <laughs> taking them for a beer, like all the, all the stereotypical things that yeah, you would yeah, yeah, associate yeah. and then you move into a, a, you know, where you're calling infrastructure managers and they don't want to talk to you and you can't use your yeah, presence yeah. and your body language and, and things and like was that. Was it contracts that you went into? Contracts. Again, okay. Yeah. Have you always typically... Always, yeah. No, okay. So I guess, j just on that, on, on that journey really quickly, and, and obviously a lot of people will be joining, and I get this quite a lot, so a lot of people be joining the recruitment industry right now who, like, are building their expertise. Yeah. Like... From everything that you've learned right now, and I'm sure you, you help your guys and girls with this now, but like, what, what's your advice for people that are early on in their career that obviously it will come with experience, with like their expertise and yeah. what they know about the market and stuff, but what, is, what would your advice be for someone that's like, I'm, I have the right mindset, I want to learn, what else can I be doing besides speaking to candidates, clients, to build up my market expertise? Yeah. Like, what comes up for you on that? For me, like when you join recruitment, I think one of the things that the, the, I suppose the bar to entry is quite low, right? Yeah, so yeah. a lot of people get into it. I think you have to be prepared to be shot at, right? That's okay. the way I summarize it. Okay. You have to be able to ask the difficult questions, yeah. approach situations. And I think if you're, if you're the kind of person that wants to be shot at and you're happy to put yourself out there, mm. I think that's uh, people can talk themselves out of doing things. Okay. Um, so that's like number one piece of advice. So, been, so what you mean by that is be willing to ask the stupid question, be willing to maybe look a bit silly, but yeah, okay, yeah. just put, putting yourself out there where, yeah, okay, I get what you mean. There's, just, there's loads of opportunities where you go, I won't make that call, I won't ask that, right, I won't call sorry, back. Right, sorry, I got you, got so, you, got you. And, and, you know, putting yourself out there to ring that manager again and, and have that conversation, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. easy to not do it, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think, I generally believe the people that are willing to be shot at all the time <laughs> are the people that make it in recruitment quite often because yeah, they're yeah. like, cool, I can dust myself off go again, learn mm. from it. Um, but the people that put it off, you're always going to struggle. And mm. I think um, hanging around with people that are better than you, you have to do that. Yeah, so you can yeah. take bits from each and every one and, mm. and, and learn. So how, what, what was that process like of like, un, like you was the bottom of the pack, mm. you had to unlearn things. Like there'll be people listening that probably are going, maybe going through that right now. I don't know, like how, like how did you get through that? Yeah. Uh, great support from yeah. the people that were managing me and the understanding that it was going to be difficult. Um, brutal honesty, mm. um, encouragement, inspiration, yeah. self-reflection. You know, yeah. like you have to, you know, I'm a big believer in like self-talk. I like talk to myself all the time. Really? Yeah, like whether I'm playing sports or, yeah. you know, my internal kind of dialogue. Um, self-belief, mm. I, I think is really important. Where's um, that come from? Yeah. I don't know. I, I've always been the same. Really? Um, I just, yeah, I back myself in most situations, right? Yeah, whether yeah. that's a good thing or not. But um, I think, you know, unless you try, you'll never know. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'd always be the guy who wants to try. Okay. 
So let's just break this down a bit then. So obviously 12 years at um, Austin Fraser. Yeah. So obviously you're starting the infrastructure piece as you were saying. Like how long was it until like you then started taking up some manage managing responsibilities and things like that? What, just give us a bit of a timeline. Yeah, it was probably about two and a half years before I kind of, I found my feet. I was, you know, contributing well and mm. I was a, a good member of the, the contract team. And I think um, quite quickly I, I wanted to, to, to lead people. That yeah. was, you know, typically I'm, you know, sports, I like leadership, captain the football teams. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of naturally gravitate to that. So um, two and a half years, I'd say. Okay. So just, just quickly then, before we go into the leadership piece, which I'm really keen to sort of go into detail with you, uh, from your perspective now, from all of the people that you helped, supported, continue to work with now, what, what do you think a like, really good contract recruiter has to master and, and why? Um, good question. Again, being prepared to be shot at. Contract <laughs> is hard. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who says it's not, it's hard. You have to put yourself out there over and over again because not every business recruits contractors. Yeah. Perm's relatively simple. Mm. Every, per, you know, every company mm. recruits perm. Contract is that self-belief that you may have to get in the trenches for 12 months yeah. before you actually see any results. Okay. And we talk about that all the time. Um, so I think getting to grips with that, I think yeah, being shot at, um, hanging around with people that can get you through the first period, mm. being around people to learn from um, is really important for me. Because I was speaking, obviously Paul sat down here earlier, and like he he was saying he he really didn't get going. He was in he was a contract recruit, and he was saying like yeah, it took him probably about eighteen months yeah. for it to really click. Yeah. And I guess he got given the same advice that I did, which was, and I'm sure you're giving this to people where it's like Ben, keep doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. it will pay off. Yeah. So I guess my question to him, which I want to ask you, was like, so if I'm someone listening right now that's on that journey, I'm in the trenches, I keep being told like keep doing what you're doing, it'll pay off. Like, from your perspective, what are those things, day in, day out, that I need to keep showing up, yeah. doing each day, that hopefully will mean that I'll get to where I, I've, I've been sort of told that I can get to in those things? Yeah. I think you need to work out what you're good at like quite quickly. For okay. me, it was meetings, right? So okay. I used to just try and get as many meetings as possible because then you can influence the process. Once you've met someone, you've yeah, got a different yeah, yeah. relationship. I think um, that, so that what, was... meetings with clients and candidates, clients and just candidates. getting in front of people? Yeah. Um, and contracts, whether you like it or not, it's a relentless pursuit of information. <laughs> like, because perm jobs are advertised, right? You, yeah, you can yeah. find them. Contract jobs, you can't always find them. So yeah. you need to be talking to your network. You need to be pitching managers over and over and over again and finding out what they do need and when they might need it. Mm. So I think if you're not prepared to, again, put yourself out there, gather information relentlessly, contracts are a really tough gig. Yeah, yeah. What are people, all, honestly, people are so curious about this always, like, I'm sure you help people with this now. What what does this, what, what did um, the typical day plan look like for yeah. Ben at the height of uh, yeah. contract days? Like because obviously I was I was a perm recruiter, so I feel like whenever I sit down with a contract recruiter, like it's like it really can be 24/7, can't it? And yeah. like it, you could get a call from that hiring manager saying, Ben, we're, yeah. we're ready to to rock and roll, and it's 6 p.m. on a Wednesday. It's like yeah. fuck, I need to yeah. call these contractors yeah. for the next two hours. So like what? Like, because honestly, that is probably the most common area that we hear at Recruitment Mentors that people want to develop, want to improve on. Mm. And I think that it's a continuous thing. But like, yeah, talk to us a bit about what did a typical day look like that made yeah. you feel confident that you were going to get the most out of it? Um, again, it's, I think nine times out of 10, I'd probably come into my desk without a job because okay. contract's quite quick. You, you get a job, you fill it, yeah, you're yeah, back yeah. to square one again. Yeah. Um, so I think for me, it's again, information like if, mm. if I don't have the jobs very simply who has the contract jobs mm. um, so was I I, don't, I wasn't regimented in terms of like I'm doing gonna this, I'm yeah. gonna do this and do that so um, I'd just be speaking to my network where have they interviewed Fair. you know um, I'll be trying to find out who's hiring mm. and all I'm doing is just trying to find out who's got the contract jobs and I'm gonna try and find a way to get in there and it's just a relentless um, <laughs> continuation it's, it's not particularly glamorous yeah um, and there is no substitute for picking the phone up on contract and mm. having conversations with people. Yeah, yeah. What, what did you do? Because I, I'm, I feel like the same for like if you're a perm recruiter, or contract recruiter. But just on this topic of like it really can be twenty four seven. Like, what, what did you do to make sure you you didn't burn yourself out? <sighs> I, I look back now and I'm, I'm wondering if I did. Like, I did, really we probably did work probably a little bit longer hours. And you mm. know, when I first started, when I was trying to build that that desk. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm in love with the game, so I just kind fair, of fair. did it, right? I, yeah, yeah. My wife laughs now, but I'd be calling candidates on the sofa at like 
eight o'clock at night, half nine at night, right? Yeah, like, yeah. because in contract, if you don't take that chance, someone else will take yeah, it. Else it's just will. gone. That's the thing, isn't it? It's so short. And I think my first ever deal, everyone was going out from the office. I got the job at about five o'clock on a Friday. Yeah. And I stayed that Friday, found a candidate that lived two minutes from where the site was that the other agency hadn't found. And if I hadn't have stayed, I would never so have done I mean, that deal. Yeah. And that's the thing, when you experience that, yeah. it's also a bit of a blessing and a curse, isn't it? Because yeah. like, right, got it done, but then yeah. you're like, fuck, that, someone else yeah. could do that, so I'm not going to let anyone. <laughs> not gonna you, know, let it's, it you know, it's like you come into, you come into your desk and you call the candidate, oh, someone else has called me. Yeah, and you're yeah. like, shit, I should have called them yeah, last yeah, night. Yeah, or yeah. So I think you learn very, very quickly. Yeah, fair. So let, let's, let's unpack this leadership journey then, because as I said before we started, I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast will have aspirations to become a leader and it, it can be really challenging so mm. I guess from from what we see is like a lot of people will have the goal aspirations to become a manager a leader typically might get there because their performance because of merit yeah. and then for most people depending on how the company works like they'll get there and then typically won't have like loads of support yeah just have to yeah be a pretty bad manager to become a good one yeah. so like Obviously, I'm assuming when you, when it first started for you, like Ben still had a number, you were still very much contributing and billing. Yeah. But then, was you like mentoring responsible for like a handful of people as well? Like, how did the how did was it like that typical billing yeah. manager leader role? Yeah, absolutely. The billing billing manager. I think we got up to a team of six. I think whilst I was still billing. Yeah. I think it's still the toughest job you will do in recruitment. Yeah. I was told that from day one. I yeah. still firmly believe it is. Um, I think if you've built some of the biggest pitfalls if you haven't built a sustainable business yeah if you're starting from scratch whilst trying to run a team oh wow that's almost impossible but yeah. i have my client base i do a couple of deals yeah. whilst you know growing the team and, and trying to get them to do it as well so what, what would you say are like the fundamentals to like performing in that role do you think so obviously one of them as you said is like to give yourself a fighting chance is to have a have a like build yourself a good platform a sustainable business going into that role yeah like, yeah, what are some of the fundamentals? Because I think, obviously, like, what I always typically find is I feel like it can become really quite frustrating where you've got, you've got a number on your back that you need to do, but you're also trying to get the performance up of your team. You may end up earning less money. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's really, so, like, what, what would you say, looking back now, the fundamentals of, like, trying to, yeah, really perform in that role, do you think? Yeah, I think being really clear on what your job and your responsibilities are, okay. right? I think we've talked about this before. Yeah. It's um, if you're just chucked a team, yeah. That's not a good place to be. I think it's okay. been very clear around, this is your responsibility, that's the manager's job or that's the director's job. Right, nice. Um, okay. So, you know, if you work in one of our teams, it's, hey, you do this, yeah. the manager does that, that's my responsibility. Well, give you an example. Um, so it's it could be monthly manager. reviews. Okay, um, nice. It could be, that's the manager's job, but the lead consultant or the team leader, you're responsible for almost like a big brother kind of okay. helping with searches, fielding questions on desk. Um, yeah. Not managing someone nine to five mm. but just being there to support them and take them through that journey and show them and demonstrate the job mm. um, that's good advice so because you don't want to be in a position where your team are going ben i thought i thought that's what you were going to do yeah. i thought that's that was your job yeah so like really lay that out yeah. early what about and i know you've done some stuff with us um on this like a really common question we always hear is like how the hell do you go about managing your time and setting mm. like almost boundaries right because you want you want to make your team feel like you're there to help and you're there to support them but at the same time you don't want to be a manager who like always like gives them the answers rather than them being given yeah. the space to like find the answers themselves you know yeah, what i mean yeah how how can people go about yeah just just creating those boundaries and, and better managing their time t so they can perform but also give yeah. that space to their team yeah i think it, it needs to be a safe place that people can come back to you and go hey i'm struggling or you know yeah. um i need help but i think Things like day plans, evaluating the day before, being really militant with your day plan, saying what are you trying to achieve. Yeah. Breaking sometimes breaking it up into sprints and saying, hey, look, I want to achieve this in the next couple of hours. Cool. Off you go. If you need me, I'm over here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's review how you got on and, yeah. and, and doing it that way. So I, I think um, sitting next to someone and watching them all day is not the answer. <laughs> I think just being really clear around what that person is looking to achieve, mm. giving them some guidance around it, and then follow up is the most underrated thing in recruitment. Follow up. Follow up. I mean, if you're not going to follow up, you might as well not bother setting the person up in the first place. So, what, so, what, so if me and you sit down in the morning and you're my manager and I say, right, then the, this is my day plan. This is what I'm aiming to achieve by the end of the day. You're saying, like, are you making sure that you tie that together by going, right, how did you do today? 100%. Then? I mean, there'll be 100,000 recruiters that get set up every day because it's the manager's job. But how often do they sit down and go through, like, how did it go? What did mm. you learn? 
What do you need from me? Um, yeah, nice. Asking those key questions. Yeah. How, from your experience now, like, how, how, how many people do you think would be like the max where you would be like confident that, per like that, confident that person could do a good job? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I know there probably isn't a magic number, just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think when you start getting to like five, six, seven, it's difficult. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're running a business as well, yeah. um, it's difficult. I think like six, yeah. seven, pushing it. Yeah. Yeah, if you're listening right now and you're a billing manager and you've got like 10, 12, oh. ask for a fucking pay right Hon now. Honestly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give me a shout. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because that, jeez. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you was in that role then. When, so then when did you then transition to like a non-billing yeah. role? Like yeah, it's probably about an, another two years down the line where I, I suppose the, the job is to, in, in our business, is always kind of make yourself redundant, right? So mm, okay. if, if you're the, doing the lion's share of the deals, mm. you need to f find a way to replace yourself, whether that's giving your market away, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. feeding feeding people jobs and then eventually your contribution is a lot lower. So then it was, I was able to kind of move out when I hit my targets. Okay, nice. So uh, just interested to hear your thoughts on this and as you went on that journey. Um, yeah, when I, so I was obviously sat down with Paul before you and he's been on like a similar journey where got to direct and these things. He really believed that it was always good, even when he was in a director role, to um, always sort of have his hands involved in trying to just support the business by um, I don't know, bringing in new logos or like just all, making sure he doesn't get so far away from that where he can't maybe lead by example or just make sure that he's involved in like the current day to day. Yeah. yeah. Not that that would be a lot of his time, but he just felt that was really important. How, because you were just talking about, about there like making yourself redundant. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Do you think, because I think it can be quite easy for you to like, you don't want to be seen as someone that sits in an ivory tower and like, there's no way I'm fucking calling no. that kind of client. Like, how no. do you feel about that? Do you think, are you always, do you think that's a good thing to be involved in? Like trying to get yeah. involved in stuff like that? Or, and do you still? I think you should understand the business. I think you should never yeah. forget what's, I'll never forget what it's like to be a new person or to run a desk, right? I think yeah. people that forget that, I think you should always be humble around like yeah, how yeah. it is. Don't forget that. Like, yeah. um, yeah, I'm not out there ringing candidates every day, but if, if someone needed me to do something, I would 100% do it. And yeah, I think yeah. I'm close to the business. The difficulty when you move out is actually you don't want to be in, you can't tread on people's toes. You can't, yeah, you know, I'm sat on the desk minding my business. Someone says something, I, I want to answer the question. <laughs> but it's not my job, it's the manager's job. And um, yeah. otherwise I'm just undermining the manager. So actually that was a big thing that I had to learn was to keep my mouth shut and really? let other people like tell and, and coach. Because I'd, I'd be like, I saw that. Like, and mm. you can't do that. Hey everyone, a real quick one from me. This podcast would not be possible without our amazing podcast partners, Vincherry and Sourcebreaker. Because you listen to this podcast, you're able to get your hands on exclusive savings on both of these award-winning products. If you're a growing recruitment business, you have to check out Vincherry, who are an all-in-one operating system for your growing recruitment business. With Sourcebreaker, if you want to make sure that all of your recruiters have the best tools on the market to stand out and beat their competition, then you have to check out Sourcebreaker. Use the link in the show notes in the comments below and you'll be able to get yourself exclusive savings on these amazing products. So what, what would you say are the main differences then for Ben, the billing manager, to Ben, the whatever you want to call it? So like, yeah. I don't know what the title would be, but where you're like non, where yeah. you're like a non-billing, you made yourself redundant. Yeah. What were the main differences in maybe your mindset, your approach to things? How did you have to then think about things differently then? Well, one of the biggest challenges is that you go from being able to affect stuff personally to mm. working through people. Um, right. And one of the things you have to get your head around is if people did stuff, then I wouldn't have a job, right? So <laughs> you can't let that frustration creep in and you okay. have to accept it. People, and accept the fact that people don't care as much as you do. Mm. Um, not intentionally, but they just don't. And I think when I went on that journey, I understood it, I could then be more effective. But I think when you go hands off, I remember the first couple of weeks, you sat there and you're like, what am I gonna what do? You gonna do yeah. Like you're sitting there and you're like clicking, like how do I affect things mm. without getting involved with everyone's business? How did you end up affecting things then? And what's, what's ended up being the ways that you end up yeah. affecting things in a positive way? Well, I think you get paid to make less decisions, but bigger ones, okay. right? So less of the reactive stuff, and it might be client strategy, it might mm. be building a solution for a client, or it could be hiring strategy, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you go from making loads of small decisions every day to very few, but the impact is massive. Sure, I've got you. That's interesting. Mm. Um, so... In terms of like some of the things that I always like, how how important is, how important is self development been to you? Um, at the start, not so much. Yeah. Because I was just hell bent on being a good recruiter. Yeah. Um, 
but it's huge now. Like it's, it's the number one thing that, that I'm interested in. Really? Yeah. Like where where did that where did that spark come from? Because not everyone has that. But I feel yeah. like, like I'm I'm always a bit baffled as to like why people don't have that. I don't yeah. know if everyone will have that. I don't know. Like where did that come from for you? Is it yeah. something you cultivated? Is it definitely? I I think you get to a point where if you want to take a bigger job and get better, you need to develop skills, right? And I think mm. I didn't have those skills. Um, I think having a mentor or working in your yeah. program, if you're not if you're serious about self improvement, you, you haven't got a mentor, you're not in a program. I yeah. think. I think that's criminal, really. So I've got yeah, myself yeah. a mentor. Um, How do you go about that? In the business? No, no. Well, in, I've got a couple probably in the business, but also outside, because um, I wanted an external person. Yeah, perspective and stuff. Because otherwise you, you institutionalise a little bit by yeah, your company, yeah. right? How do, you, how do you approach that? People are always curious about that. Like, yeah. How do you do it in a way where, because I always feel like the sort of key is like you don't want the other person to feel like you're just, you're just taking, if you get what yeah. I mean. Like, ideally, you want to try and... And it is hard, but you want to come across in a way where it's like I'm some like that you're someone that would really respect their time. You're coachable. You'll li you'll listen, and maybe this is also something that I'm, you might be able to help them with. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. I think um, you have to ask is the first thing, yeah, right? Yeah. You have to ask, and I think you just have to be really honest and say, look, I like what you do. I really value your perspective. I'd love to just spend some time with you. It's mm. no no more difficult than that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I think you develop a relationship, and if they're a good person, helping people is really important, right? Mm. So okay. like, no more difficult than that. So on this like leader director journey, then what what have been? I think you've sort of spoken a bit about them, but like what what have been some of the the biggest challenges then that you've really had to work through? So I know you said around like saying less and like yeah, yeah not just giving people the answers and those things. I don't know. Is there anything else that you've really had to work on um, and challenges that you had to work on? Yeah, like I, I suppose my skills and how I influence people mm -hmm. um, is 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 definitely something. Um, because you are, you know, you're trying to take a group of people from A to B, and I think mm. making sure everyone feels it's fair, they understand it, it's inspirational. Yeah. So things like storytelling and giving people vision and and creating opportunities like quite difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it's good enough to just say, hey, work really hard and do deals. People are like, mm, nah. <laughs> like, I think they need more than that. So, yeah, working on my ability to influence people on a bigger scale. Um, making bigger decisions mm. that impact lots of people. Mm. Um, how have you got better at, you just touched on it there, like how have you got better at understanding what people are driven by? Yeah. Um, That's hard. It is, and I think you only get there if you truly care about people. But mm. like, I truly care about the people that work for me, yeah. genuinely. And, you know, I want to understand them. I want to understand their family life, everything, and, and spend time with these people. That yeah. It's not talking about how many phone calls have you made. It's yeah, like, yeah. cool, how are you? You know, yeah, how's your yeah. family? All that kind of stuff. Um, just lead them with empathy. Yeah, and build some trust where they feel that they can share stuff with you. Yeah. That's, that's a big part of it. Love it. What, so how, how, have you, how have you remained motivated in these 12 years? Well, I've got family, which is, <laughs> obviously, as you know, you know um, I think everything that I kind of do is linked directly to that. Like yeah, I want to yeah. create opportunities for my family. So. Um, I feel that as a company, we're on a mission to do some, some good stuff. And mm. I think like, I want to be part of that. I like doing stuff that, is challenging. Mm. So if I'm doing challenging work with people that are on the same boat, on the same you know bus as me, yeah, yeah. that feels good. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could necessarily just babysit a business. Like I, I need mm. to be kind of doing something big. What? Um, what? How have you? And then I guess on this as well, like how have you gone about remaining current? Is like I guess and like sort of not out of touch with things, mm. out of interest. Because again, I know I've sort of touched on it already, but I think sometimes that can happen where like, yeah, like if you've been in this sort of non-billing or leadership role for a while where you can sort of just, yeah, lose the nuance of the, the challenges that your team are facing yeah. day to day. How have you gone about doing everything you can to remain current and understand the nuances of the challenges, the challenges and those things? Pretty simply, I just ask the people doing the job, right? Yeah. I, I don't pretend to know everything about the recruitment industry right now. I'm yeah. not at the cold face of the business, right? So mm. um, very rarely do I tell people what to do. Mm. I'll sit there and I'll almost provide counsel and say, look, what are your challenges? What are you trying to do? Have you thought about this? Yeah, yeah. So the people that, you know, the cold face, they're the people that should be telling me mm. um, what's going on. And I'm there to help build a solution for them. So yeah, yeah, I love that. yeah I just, it's wrong for me to say what's going on in the market because I'm not in it. So let's obviously, Austin Fraser going into COVID, I'm assuming, like I have no idea how many people you were at that point, but obviously yeah. big business. Yeah. So I feel like, just obviously how the challenges would manifest in a bigger business like that would just, just be even more difficult. Yeah. 
how like going into this year not to go in like the classic like work from home poll yeah. scenario but yeah. like how how do you feel about this sort of hybrid work from home leading remote like how have you found that challenging how's it taken shape yeah it's challenging right but we we told everyone straight away like work where you want work where you work best yeah, yeah. um we just went i think it's difficult to say you can work here on this day so we just said look yeah. do what you need to do yeah i suppose the 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 skill in it is to try and provide an environment where people can learn from home yeah but also in the office mm. um you know still a good uptake in the office right but my job as a leader is to create a, an environment where people want to come in they value it they can mm. collaborate but also they can work from home if they want to and, and that's on them um yeah, yeah so it has been challenging and changing mindsets and 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 you know, I, I never know where any of my staff are, right? Because that's generally their business. Um, yeah. So I think changing perception and, and, and what the old school you need to be in at this time. Because mm. you, you hire a lot of young people, don't you? Yeah. So like, what, what are you seeing then? Like, do they, I, I feel like from the conversation that I've had, typically most young people like are leaning towards, like I'd really like the idea of being in the office more. Yeah. Um, and then maybe, I don't know, maybe I'd like the flexibility to work from home one or two days a week. But then when I was speaking to a lot of companies, how they're basically deciding whether Ben Hobday, the recruiter, can work from home or not is done on, on his experience. Yeah. So what I've heard a lot is like, if Ben's a trainee, then he, he's going to be in the office for five days a week and that's yeah. what they're owning. But then as he gets more experience, then he'll have more flexibility. Like, I don't know, how's yeah. that? How, how, how are you seeing that? Because you speak to a lot of young people and have young people in your business. Yeah, I think it's difficult when you say you can do that, but you can't do that, right? Mm. I'd feel really uncomfortable saying, well, I can do it because you joined, you can't do it. Yeah. For me, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that, um, but I understand it. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. a lot of young people, my job is to make sure that if that's what they want to do, yeah. which makes sense, if you've not done the job, get together and mm. do it together. That makes perfect sense. My job is to create an environment where you can do that mm. um, and that you don't come into the office and you're the only one there because no one wants to come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd what have you found young people typically want? Not to paint everyone on the same brush, but what have no, you typically like, seen? Like, I think they want to feel part of something. I think yeah. you know the people that we're hiring, they want to come into the office, they want to learn, they want to see it. Because mm. a lot of time, it's blind faith in recruitment a lot of time, because yeah. you're doing something because someone's telling you to do it. Yeah. But until you see it happen, sometimes you go, oh, I get it now. Yeah. Um, so I think they want to be able to go to the gym at lunchtime, yeah. come in at 11 because they've got something to do. Yeah. I think they want the flexibility, but they definitely want to be together. So I'm all for make the decisions that suit you, right? Mm. I think it's a social piece as well. If you think of who your friends are today mm. and how many of them maybe you work through work and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? I think yeah. you know, like that, a big part of the whole being young and working in London and stuff is, is making those connections. Yeah. Maybe not through a screen. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Mm. Um, just curious, and then I want to I want to speak to you about the because I think um, from what I've seen, Austin Fraser has done a lot of good things. But I know you sit on the diversity and inclusion um, board or yeah. faculty in, in the the business. But just curious, like what do you from your lens, like what do you think Austin Fraser has done really well that have enabled it to scale or scale in the sense of like in the UK, different places. I don't know what, yeah. what comes to mind for you, which you, cause not a lot of recruitment companies will get to where yeah. Austin Fraser have got to. And you've been there for a long time. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think, you know, if you look at the founders, they're pretty inspirational people starting yeah. in a garage, you know, yeah. I think people buy into that. And I think yeah. the continual drive to be better, do more is really mm. inspirational and the people naturally follow it. Um, create an opportunity for like people like me, who came in with no experience and now I run a function, yeah. we're still trying to do that with the people that we hire now. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we don't often come and hire external people in. We're trying to promote that, give people opportunity. And the reason I'm still here is literally I love it and the opportunity is endless. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think if you give that people and you inspire them, I think people stick around. Because, yeah, that's what I definitely noticed is like, I don't know what the average tenure is at mm. Austin Fraser, but if you were to like go online, I feel like there's, there's a good cluster of people that have been there for a... Yeah. A while. So, like, how how do you? I think one of the biggest challenges this year for recruitment companies is going to be attracting, but also retaining yeah. their people. So, like, how do you feel about retention of mm. recruiters? Like, because I'm sure this is something that is top of mind and you think yeah. about. 
Yeah, I think if you lead with empathy and you mm. generally care about people, you can get in front of maybe some of the problems. If you don't care about people, you don't give a shit about them personally and they're having a rough time, they may, may leave, right? Mm. Now, we're not perfect, but yeah, yeah. I think if you generally care about people, you inspire them, you, you give them an opportunity mm. that they can continually grow and learn. Because I think, look, you can get a job anywhere in London doing recruitment. Yeah. Um, how you do it, who you do it with, what you're marching towards, these are really important things yeah, yeah, um, yeah. if you're smart, right? So I think if, as long as you give people that, you're, you're halfway there. Would you say, what, what, out of those things you said, who you're doing it with, where you're marching to, I don't know, any of those do you think are like really important over the others out of interest? Um, definitely thinking, knowing where you're going, yeah. what, what is your part to play in the bigger picture yeah. um, is, is really important. But I think doing a job that you, you love with people that also share same values, beliefs, behaviours, that's really important. Um, I think if you're not comfortable there, you don't buy into the company, it's going to be a very difficult job to stick around. Mm. So talk to me about the DNI piece then. Mm -hmm. um, like I think I, I caught up with um, I caught up with Pete a while ago, and yeah. he, he told me there's some really interesting things that you're doing yeah. around when people apply. There's things that like you can't see, and like um, a lot of things are not. I don't know. There's loads of different things, but like where like what what's what's going on in like when in those conversations at the moment on. I don't know what you call it. Is it, is it like yeah. a sort of faculty or like a board? charter? Charter, sorry, yeah. yeah. So what 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 have been like the main topic of conversations, and what what are all, what is top of mind for all of you yeah. at the moment when it comes to DNI? Yeah, I suppose as a company that wants to grow, yeah. diversity and inclusion is paramount. Like diversity of thought, diversity of mind. Yeah, like you have to do that, and we're certainly not perfect. Yeah, and yeah. it's something that we we know, and, and we generally care about, right? And including Pete, so. I think that was the, the first part was just to say, look, cool, this is where we want to get to. Mm. Um, getting some external help is really important to, okay. to come and say, this is where you guys are at. This is where you're at, yeah. Um, giving us a plan. Um, but the charter really at the moment is saying, hey, where are we? Yeah. What are we seeing? What are we feeling? Um, brutal honesty yeah. is the first couple were quite funny because we weren't probably honest, a lot okay. of people. I'm, yeah. I'm honest. I'm just say how I feel, right? Yeah, yeah. But you've got juniors in there that might not speak up. So how big is the charter? Uh, I think it's about 15, 16 of us at the minute. Oh, wow, okay. Um, but we will invite more people in. But I think having those honest conversations about as a business, mm -hmm. if you're going to pretend it's all rosy, probably not going to get anywhere. So, has it helped having like a dedicated group of people like driving, like I don't know, driving a conversation or that? I'm assuming like that, like the, yeah, that charter is accountable yeah. and responsible for driving initiatives, gathering how people feel about things across the wider business. Has that yeah. helped having people there? Because I think it's a great idea, right? Regardless of how small you are as a company, there might be one or two people, even if it starts there, that are like really passionate about it, that like that no doubt other people in the company would deem it important, but like there's probably going to be people in your business that are going to be better at driving it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So has it helped having like the, that group of people? Definitely. And hopefully it inspire other people to get involved. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think if it's not important to you, you're going to have a hard time at our business because if you want to scale to where we want to get to, unless you, this is in, in the forefront of what you're trying to do, I don't think you can do it. Mm. So hopefully it'll inspire people. It gets the conversations going. Um, it's just a good place to start. Yeah. 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 So what have been some of the like, initiatives that have maybe have gone, have gone well so far? Like what's, what's been going on? Really, we're at the point where we're just finding out brutally where we are. Okay. Um, and then we had one yesterday, actually, where we were talking about experiences, sharing experiences. We've got a follow-up to that. Um, okay. Pete and I have been speaking to external providers around coming in to help us. Yeah. Because um, I really value that external kind of piece. What, what is it you're looking for help with out of interest? A plan. Like... You know, someone, I think it makes sense to work with someone who's done this before and can yeah. give us a real honest opinion of where we are as a company. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, do, we, we have anonymized CVs and, you know, we're trying to make sure that that's fair, but that's a tiny, 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 tiny part. Tiny bit, yeah. If someone comes in and doesn't feel included or yeah, yeah. they're not seeing a representation of themselves, that's a problem. So I think um, having, a, having a plan so that everyone's on board is, is where we need to be. What, how, what, what's like the typical advice you give when like someone, it is, it is important to them, they're curious about it, they want to understand more. But I think in today's society, a lot of people are worried about saying the wrong thing, yeah. doing the wrong thing. Like, obviously a lot of it starts with self-education. Yeah. So like, what, what's your typical advice for a recruiter listening to this that's like, you know what, it, it's coming up more and more in my daily conversations. Personally, I, I'm actually curious about it, it's important to me. 
But yeah, like where do I even start? Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. We talked about it yesterday in the group. It's like educating yourself. Yeah. Um, it is, it's hard work to inspire change or understand it. And you've got to do it. It's about action. Um, and I think we're all taking that. We're all doing little things ourselves mm. to, to try and educate ourselves. And I think that's the first part. Um, and learning to, hopefully you're in a company where you can speak up yeah, or yeah. talk to someone. Um, mm. But yeah, educating yourself is the, the beginning part for me. Nice. So uh, as we come to the end then, obviously you've been in the game for a while. Yeah. Like what, 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 what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the, the recruitment industry? So I know I've mentioned them a few times, but for example, um, Paul's in, in the journey of selling these embedded talent solutions, yeah. which seems like they've popped up quite a lot. I don't know if you're doing any of that yeah. at AF. Like, yeah, so like, what, what are some of the trends that you're seeing that you're quite interested in or that you think um, are going to be more prominent as we go over the next couple of years? Yeah, well, I think the perm market is flying. Everyone knows that. Yeah. So I think being agile enough, like we've done an embedded model, like we've nice. got that. Um, What's been the learners on that out of interest? Because it sounds great. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> from the conversations I've had, it, it can be really difficult. Yeah, yeah commercially it's challenging, yeah. like how you, you package it up. Yeah. Um, what you're accountable for, how it works, yeah, I think yeah, it's quite challenging. I think this, all these things are about building value. Yeah. Like retainers are being sold left, right, and center, right? And there's yeah. great stories and bad stories about people not delivering on them. So yeah. I think um, being agile enough to, to find the right solution for that client. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we should be selling contract solutions even harder because the, the, the war for talent is, is raging. Yeah, so yeah. we should be selling contract solutions even harder now. Okay. So you've got, so yeah, different. I get evolution in like services. Mm -hmm. What what else are you thinking about or looking at that you're curious about? Top of mind. Um, the top of my mind is hiring good people, right? <laughs> that, that's 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 top of mind. But I think um, making sure that our consultants are embedded in the, the parts of the market that we need them to be. Okay. So we've been really specific around the parts of the market they they're responsible for, okay. and the kind of service they will deliver to that mm. portion of the market. Okay. Um, which has led to some really great results, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay then, so on that topic that you said around like, yeah, really dedicated to hiring great people, like a, a lot of people will be thinking about, I think that would be, yeah, easily in the top three challenges. Yeah. If it's not, how are we gonna go about attracting the candidates that we know our clients need? It's gonna be, how can we be attracting talent internally? Yeah. From the conversations that I'm having, companies have little or no success getting experience recruiters through the door mm -hmm. because yeah, I think if, if you're half decent right now, you should be making some good money. So the sort of why behind your move, you've got to really believe as, yeah. as a leader and manager. So a lot of people really going back to the sort of trainee, non-experience. So like what, what's, what, what's really worked for you guys on, yeah. on that? Just for advice for people, like, I know there's not going to be one thing, but like, yeah. like what's, t what, what's typically worked to help uh, you guys get more young people through the door yeah. and hire internally, do you think? Yeah. Um understanding where you're going and what that person's journey is. Because I think, again, okay. you can, if someone's interviewing at four different companies, it's the same job. Yeah. How you do it, who you do it with, how it feels, yeah. they're really important. Um, make sure you're, you can really articulate that yeah. and they, you, yeah, they, they will have clarity on yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. Like, you know, um, if you can't, and even if you've got experienced people, you need to be able to sell why they should come and join you on mm. your mission because you could do the job anyway you could do it for yourself um, yeah, yeah, yeah. what does it mean and can you spark that interest uh, like I'm a massive fan of grads and inexperienced mm. people I didn't have that much experience um, uh, you know this notion that everyone's gone back to hiring grads well I've always done it and some of the best yeah, people yeah. we've got are you know they've not even come from sales or recruitment they've done lots of different jobs yeah um, so for me I'd be really open-minded and for hiring managers I mean, I've got the same list of quality skills and behaviours that I've always used. Mm. And if people don't match them, I don't hire them. Yeah. So be really clear on what you're trying to hire. Yeah, no, I think that's good advice because I think particularly in the market right now, you, you can, it, it can be quite easy to drop what you're looking for, can't it? Because yeah. you know, you've got this guy, Ben, can he do the job? Yeah, I reckon. I mean, we've got these plethora of jobs that we can give him straight away. Yeah. So he could be smashing in deals quite yeah. quickly. But for you, you've, you've really stuck to your yeah. standards. Yeah. Why is that important? Just because you know how it'll play out? You just know, I mean, we've all, I'm sure as a business, we've hired people that we think, you know, they're going to come in and, yeah. and smash it. And look, with salespeople, you should be able to sell. If you've mm. done recruitment, you're going to be able to sell that you're good at it. Yeah, I think yeah. um, 
for me, it's, it's being sure what you want that person to do. Yeah. If you want someone to come in and fill loads of jobs, then you could probably get a delivery person to do it. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to pay over the odds for someone to come in and, and do that for you. So be sure what you want to hire. If there's any doubt on any of the list, just don't hire them. Yeah. No, I think that's good advice. So anyone listening, like, instead of just being like, I need to get people, take a step back and can you clearly articulate why, why this person should join your company, the journey that you're on, the mission that you're on, where you're going, where does that person fit in with that plan, uh, that on the business stuff, right? Yeah. And um, that, that should give you a fighting chance of having people pick your company over yeah. the next company where the job's going to look very the same. Yeah. Um, so to wrap up then, where, uh, what, what would your advice be for those listening to this that absolutely want, want to smash this year? Like, just, yeah, just, just interested to hear your thoughts on like, yeah, what would, your, what would Ben's advice be for anyone that wants to absolutely have a, a great year this year? Keep your foot down, mm. like now, now's the time to do it. Um, be really open-minded with the kind of solutions that you have to provide. Yeah. Um, even if you've got lots of jobs, keep trying to get better ones. There's better mm. clients. You might have a hundred jobs on your list, but there are better clients, better fees. Mm. Keep your foot down and, and just continue to go for it. Don't, don't coast because things may slow down, they may not, but yeah. don't get complacent. Down. No. Ben, it's been a pleasure. Thank Cheers. you, mate. <laughs> nice, man. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. I hope you got value from the conversation and there was a number of key takeaways. So please don't forget to like, share, and please do share your key takeaways in the comments below if you did have some. And uh, thanks for supporting the show.